Finding your seats, I want to invite you to turn to the book of Micah. The book of Micah. You'll remember last week we were in Zechariah. We found Zechariah by starting in Matthew and turning backwards a few books. If you turn back a few more books past Zechariah, you'll eventually encounter the book of Micah. We'll be in chapter 5. And this morning we'll be reading in verses 2 through the beginning of verse 5. But before we do that, let's go ahead and take a moment and pray and ask the Lord to be present with us as we open his word. Lord, we are dependent upon your spirit to come and open our eyes and open our ears to hear what you have for us to hear this morning. Would you do that through the power of your spirit? And would you help us to leave with great hope and great peace in our hearts through Jesus, our King, in whose name we pray. Amen. Micah 5, beginning in verse 2. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. Amen. This is the word of the Lord through the prophet Micah. So I want to take you back as we begin this morning, take you back in history for a moment to the year 1914. 1914, the world was at war, and in Europe, along what was called the Western Front, the German army and the British army had taken up this tactic of digging trenches that faced each other no more than 50 to 100 yards apart as they fired upon each other. And it was in this setting, in the midst of one of history's most brutal wars, when humanity was perhaps at its worst, in a war that saw more than 25 million lives lost, that we find one of the most unusual accounts in all of modern warfare. Reports from Christmas Eve around 8.30 in the evening state that a British officer sent a message back to headquarters. And on Christmas Eve, he wrote this message to headquarters that read, The Germans have illuminated their trenches and are singing songs and wishing us a Merry Christmas. Numerous accounts from that night highlight that further down the trench lines, the two sides began serenading each other with Christmas hymns. The Germans singing Silent Night and the British responding by singing the first Noel. This unexpected turn of events led scouts from both sides at great risk to their own lives to cautiously venture into the shell-blasted wasteland between the two trenches. And over the next couple of days, hundreds of soldiers would leave their trenches, would shake hands, and even exchange gifts with their counterparts. Many reports even describing that soccer matches broke out between the Germans and the British which the Germans won. What drew these men out of their trenches? What caused them to risk their very lives to enter into no man's land? Well, the answer, I believe, is found in the words of one German officer who was quoted as saying this to his British counterpart. He said, tomorrow you can fight for your country and I'll fight for mine. But today we have peace. It's amazing what human beings will do, what great lengths they will go to for peace. Of course, the the Christmas truce of 1914 only provided a temporary truce. The, The commanders would soon call their soldiers back to the trenches and the war would carry on for four more years. But despite despite its its fleeting nature, the Christmas truce remains a symbol and a reminder of that deep longing for peace that resides within the human heart. I'm certain it's a longing that you have residing in your heart this morning. 
a longing not just for peace, but for true and lasting peace that brings unity to our conflict, that brings assurance to our uncertainty, and that brings rest to our striving. In our passage this morning, the prophet Micah reminds us not only that true and lasting peace is available, but the prophet Micah tells us how we are to obtain that peace. And so as we dive into these prophetic books, as we look at the book of Micah, as we looked at the book of Zechariah last week, it's important to remember that these prophecies, these promises that are written down for our benefit, aren't written in a vacuum. God's word to Micah was spoken into a particular context, and so as we did last week with the prophet Zechariah, we want to we want to take a moment to understand what it is that's going on in the book of Micah so that we can understand this passage that's written down and we can apply it appropriately. And so if you take your eyes to verse 5 of Micah 5 there, the end of the text that we just read, you see there's a future promise of dwelling secure with a lasting peace. Now this was an important message for those that Micah was sent to prophesy to. It was a needed message at this point in history because these individuals were about to go through some very difficult times. In the 8th century BC, Israel was an idolatrous nation and had earned the judgment of God. They had openly worshipped false gods on the high places of Israel. They had engaged in all sorts of wickedness and oppression. They had disregarded the word of the Lord, choosing instead to listen to those who tickled their ears. Their leaders were unjust. Their prophets and their priests were interested only in their own financial gain. And the people presumed upon the Lord's grace and presence and protection, despite their open rebellion. And so in Micah chapter 2, we read that because of their uncleanness, the land God had provided them was no longer a land of rest, which led the Lord to tell Micah to proclaim that God himself would lead an enemy king against Israel and Judah. They would cry for peace, but none would come. That was, that was the judgment that would fall on the northern kingdom during Micah's day. And it was the judgment that Micah said would come to the gates of Jerusalem in the not-so-distant so future. So in Micah chapter 4, verse 10, the prophet writes, Writhe and groan, O daughter of Zion. Like a woman in labor, for now you will go out from the city and dwell in the open country. You shall go to Babylon. And so in the book of Micah, we find two different kinds of promises side by side that cannot and must not be separated. The promise of judgment that is to come, followed by the promises of rescue and redemption and assurance and peace. And it's a good reminder for us this morning in the world that we live in because it's become quite unpopular to speak of God's judgment and to warn others about the reality of hell. But we must remember that the promises of peace that we find in Scripture will have little value if we bypass the threat of God's judgment. The ministry of Micah, much like our ministry today, was to proclaim the coming judgment of God on sin but to follow it by pointing sinners to their hope of peace. And this was a true and lasting peace that Micah wrote about. You see, according to Micah 5, verse 2, this true and lasting peace, this, this peace would be connected to the birth of a child who would be a ruler in Israel. Now, we know from the testimony of Scripture, and we'll be reminded this morning as we look at Micah chapter 5, that this promised child that would be born, this child that would rule over God's people and bring true and lasting peace, we know that child is Jesus. He was the hope of 8th century B.C. Israel, and he is still our great hope this morning, as we're reminded during this Christmas season when we take time to, to celebrate his birth. Last week, we saw how in the Incarnation, Jesus became our great high priest. And this morning, what we're going to look at is we're going to see how in his Incarnation, Jesus became our promised King. And there's two things that I want to consider with you this morning about the Incarnation of King Jesus. First, I want to look with you at the circumstances of his Incarnation. And then second, I want to look with you at the impact 
of his incarnation. And so first, look with me beginning in verse 2 of chapter 5. The text says, But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, now Ephrathah, little segment here, parentheses, Ephrathah is an alternative name for Bethlehem. There were two Bethlehems in Israel, and so that Ephrathah is kind of a nickname for Bethlehem. It highlights that this is the Bethlehem in Judah. It's David's Bethlehem. It's the city of David. That's all that means there. He says, But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be the ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. And so there's two things I want to highlight for you this morning about the circumstances surrounding the birth or the first coming, if you will, of this promised king. First thing I want you to notice is that this promised king would be born into obscurity. This promised king would be born into obscurity. With such wonderful blessings attached to his arrival, we might expect that this promised king would be born into pomp and circumstance in the capital city of Jerusalem. But instead, the prophet Micah declares that he would be born into obscurity in the the insignificant, almost overlooked town of Bethlehem. How many of you know this morning that the Lord delights to bring significance out of the things that we deem insignificant? That he is magnified when he works out his plans through the weak things in the world, the small things in the world, and the overlooked things in the world. The prophet says, from you, insignificant Bethlehem, shall come forth for me a ruler in Israel. Now, biblically, there's there's quite a bit of significance in that reality because this wouldn't be the first time that a ruler in Israel would come from Bethlehem. King David also was from Bethlehem. He was a shepherd. He had nothing special about his physical appearance, but he was anointed by God to rule in Israel, and to bring great blessing to God's people. And so as King David came from Bethlehem, this promised king of Micah chapter 5 would also come from humble Bethlehem. And that particular aspect, that this promised king would be born into obscurity, it's, it's something that was widely known in Israel, even 700 years after Micah wrote these words. If you think about the, the, the Magi that we read about earlier, when they arrived at Herod's palace, having seen the Christmas star, declaring that the king of the Jews had been born. Of course, Herod wasn't excited about that news like the Magi were. He was troubled by that news, and he summoned the chief priests and the scribes to find out where this promised king would be born. This, this king who Matthew identifies as the Christ. Herod says, where is he to be born? And the scribes answered in Matthew 2, verse 5, they said, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet Micah. We'll we'll actually hear again in the gospel that we're walking through, in in the gospel of John, chapter 7, in verses 41 through 43. It's written there. When the people were trying to figure out if Jesus was really the Christ. And they had this this misunderstanding. Remember that Jesus was one who came from Nazareth because that's where Mary and Joseph dwelt. And they asked, beginning in verse 41, they said, is the Christ to come from Galilee? Has not the scripture, that is Micah 5 verse 2, said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? And so 700 years before his arrival, the prophet Micah prophesied that the promised king would be born into obscurity in humble Bethlehem. And 700 years later, Jesus, identified by the Magi as the true king of Israel, was born in a feeding trough in Bethlehem, the city of David. Isn't that incredible? Jesus, the promised king, born into obscurity. And what could be more appropriate than the one who identifies himself as the bread of life, being born in Bethlehem, a city that literally translates to the house of bread. It's amazing. Born into obscurity, born according to God's perfect plan. There is no coincidence that the bread of life was born in the house of bread. So you see, though this this promised king, he was born into obscurity, 
Notice, secondly, that he would be born from eternity. At the end of verse 2, the text says that he would be born and that his coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. That is to say that the coming of this promised king was in accord with what God had determined from eternity past. And what that means is that if God had put this plan in motion from eternity past, then what we should expect to see from the outset of his revelation to mankind through Micah's day is we should expect to see evidence of God's plan to send a king who would bring true and lasting peace. And you know what? That's exactly what we find in God's revelation. Right from the outset of his revelation in the book of Genesis, chapter 17, beginning in verse 6, the Lord says, I will make you, speaking to Abraham, exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and what? Kings shall come from you. That is to say that the promised seed of Abraham, the the seed through whom God told Abram in Genesis 12 that all the families of the earth would be blessed, that seed would be a royal seed. What we see is from the outset, God's gracious plan was to overturn the curse that sin brought about in the human race in Genesis 3 and to bless all the families of the earth through a coming king. So we see it in Genesis 17 from the outset of God's revelation. We see it in 2 Samuel chapter 7 and the Lord's promise to King David beginning in verse 12. God said this to David Through the prophet Nathan, he said, When your days are fulfilled, David, and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So God's plan was not only to bless all the families of the earth through a royal seed, but in 2 Samuel chapter 7, we get more detail that God's plan was to raise up an offspring from David's seed who would rule on David's throne forever. Then we have Isaiah. Now Isaiah is significant because Isaiah prophesied at the same time as the prophet Micah. Listen to what he said in Isaiah chapter 9 beginning in verse 6. He said, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, don't miss that one, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Listen to this next part. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. This was God's unchanging plan from eternity past to raise up a divine king from the line of Abraham and from the line of David who though born into obscurity would reign on David's throne forever and bring true and lasting peace that has no end. The New Testament from the beginning identifies that promised king as Jesus. The son of Abraham, the son of David as we read in the beginning of Matthew 1 and his genealogy God with us according to the end of Matthew chapter 1, born into obscurity, but born from eternity to bring lasting peace. And so those are the circumstances of the incarnation of the promised king that we see in verse 2. And so I want to look next with you to verses 3 through 5, the remainder of the passage, and to see the impact of the incarnation of this promised king. An impact that's summarized for us, look at the beginning of verse 5. The text says, he shall be their peace. There's two aspects of this peace that this coming king would bring. First, there's the peace that he gives us with God. Then there's the peace that he gives us as his people in the midst of a fallen world. We see that peace with God beginning in verse 3. Start there. The text says, therefore he, that is God, shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. That that language there that we see in verse 3, that language of give them up, it's judgment language. And in the previous chapter, chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, we see God's intention to judge the sin of Judah. Judah. 
The text says there will be no king, in verse 9, to sit on David's throne as they were exiled to Babylon. The first part of Micah 5.3 is is not debated whatsoever. God would judge his people. The question for us is what does the end of Micah 5.3 mean? What does it mean when Micah the prophet writes, until the time when she who is in labor has given birth? What does that mean? It's hard in the context to believe that this is merely referring to the remnant's return from Babylon 70 years later. That's what some commentators want to hold to, is this is just referring to the return from exile. Remember in chapter 4, there's a vacancy on David's throne under God's judgment. And then beginning in chapter 5, there's the promise of a king's birth. It's it's literally a birth that is, a, a verse that is pregnant with expectation. So in chapter 3, we have the promise of the king's birth. And then in verses 4 and 5, you have this ruler who has apparently been born standing and shepherding God's people. The birth is promised in verse 2. The king is born in verse 3 to gather the forsaken people of God. And then he's standing and shepherding God's people in the strength of the Lord in verse 4. Notice again in verse 3 that Micah tells us that the end result of this birth, the end result of the incarnation of this promised king, is the gathering of God's covenant people. This this gathering is connected to the incarnation, and and it's what Paul writes about in Galatians 3 and 4. Before faith came, Paul said, we were captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under that guardian. For in Christ you are sons of God through faith. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. You are all one in Christ. And listen, if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring. You are true Israel, heirs according to promise through faith in the coming king. What Micah foretold. How, how, how does Paul say that that happens? Paul continues in Galatians 4. He says, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive adoption as sons. What Micah foretold, the birth of a king that would result in the gathering of God's people was fulfilled in the coming of Jesus. Born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law. That's the gospel message we proclaim. The message that brings peace with God and allows his chosen people to return to a covenant relationship with him. Paul reminds us of the significance and the necessity of Jesus' birth. He reminds us that Jesus, God's eternal son, took on flesh and was born of a woman. He was born under the law, but unlike us, unlike us, he lived in perfect obedience to it. But ultimately, Jesus was born to redeem. His perfect life qualified him to be our substitute, to take the judgment of God that we deserve upon himself in his death on the cross so that we could have peace with God, not through the works of the law, but through faith in him, turning from our sins and returning to God as true sons of Abraham and heirs of God's covenant promises. Do you have peace with God this morning as you sit here. So many think, so many in our midst, so many in our world, in our community around us, they, they think, if you ask them, do you have peace with God? They'd say, oh yes, I have peace with God. I pray to him every day. I, I read his Bible. I go to church. Sure, I have peace with God. Things are great. But the problem is, is that God has not agreed to their terms of peace. Imagine what would happen at the Christmas truce of 1914 if both sides had not agreed to peace. The consequences were life and death, but when it comes to peace with God, the consequences are far greater than physical life and death. It's eternal life and eternal death. God has made his terms for peace clear through the Bible, and they are not negotiable. We are all sinners, and as the just judge of the universe, God will not overlook our sin, just as he did not overlook the sin of his people in Micah's day. 
It must be judged, otherwise God is not a just judge. And if God is not a just judge, then God ceases to be God. That's why God sent his son into the world as a gift for you and for me. That all who trust in Jesus by faith alone for the forgiveness of their sins can be redeemed and at peace with God. The just laying down his life for the unjust so that God might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Peace with God and redemption from the judgment our sins deserve comes only through faith in Jesus. And for the unbeliever who's sitting here this morning or listening online, this is where the search for true and lasting peace must begin. Because if we desire true and lasting peace, it must begin with an assurance that we have true and lasting peace with God through faith in his Son, whom he sent. What benefit would it be if we have temporary peace in this world, that if everything went fine in this world, but eternally we're damned to hell? The coming of this first king would not only bring peace with God, but peace for God's covenant people in a fallen world. We see that beginning in verse 4. Look there with me. The text says, He shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord and the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth. This promised king, like King David, would be a shepherd. This promised king would shepherd his people, standing ever watchful and ready to act, to preserve, and to protect his people, exercising divine strength and authority to lead and to feed and to protect his flock, even in the midst of a fallen world. For it's in a fallen world that shepherds are needed, right? To protect the flock against predators, to lead the flock to green pastures, to provide healing to those who have been wounded or hurt. And have we not seen exactly that as we've walked through John's gospel? That the truth that we hear in John chapter 1, that the king of Israel has come and he is the good shepherd of John chapter 10, healing and nourishing and protecting his own in the strength and majesty of the Lord. It was evident in his earthly ministry and it remains true even after he ascended to his father's right hand that Jesus still shepherds his flock with divine strength and authority. He is our chief shepherd, according to 1 Peter chapter 5. He stands in heaven even now, having been exalted to the highest place as the king of heaven and given a name that is above every name, guarding his flock from trouble, ensuring provision for our needs, comforting and caring for the wounded, and leading us by his spirit and through his word. What's the impact, Micah says in verse 4? They shall dwell secure. Under the reign of the shepherd king, his people would have security and peace. Peace with God and peace in the midst of a fallen world through faith in Christ. Now, that's not a peace that means everything is going to be easy in the midst of a fallen world. It's it's not a promise that life is just going to go smoothly, that we won't experience times of suffering and lack and pain but that in the midst of this fallen world, we can have peace because we know that in Jesus we are not forsaken. That he stands at every moment in the strength and majesty of God to ensure our protection and preservation. And because of that reality, we know that whatever trials befall us, whatever suffering may come our way, whatever enemies may stand against us, we can trust that we are secure under his all-knowing and all-powerful care. He is not just our peace with God. He is our true and lasting peace in the midst of a fallen world until he comes again and makes all things new. True peace isn't found in political leaders. True peace isn't found in financial security. True peace isn't found in different circumstances. And true peace isn't found in social reform or in any other human means. It's truly amazing to think about the lengths to which we will go and the things we are willing to do even for a moment of peace in our lives. The devil himself has packaged all of these things for our consumption, 
beckoning us like a snake oil salesman to purchase them because he knows that we so quickly will. He knows that we desire hope for relief and he knows our sinful, foolish hearts will quickly buy in to believe things like if only this man wasn't the president or was the president or if only this governor or this senator would act in this way or to think if I had this much money in my bank account this week, if only I could make it to Friday night and the end of the work week, or when my kids get older, or when I retire, or if I could only escape from this situation, if I could only forget my sorrows for just one moment, then I'd have peace. My friends, that is a lie from the pit of hell, and it is one that we must reject Because the devil has designed these things to keep our eyes from the true and lasting peace that he, that God has so graciously provided us. So this morning as you sit here, what difficulties and stresses are you facing in your life? Have difficulties at work created a heavy burden? Has conflict in relationships been an adversary for the peace that you are seeking? Have you grown anxious about some uncertainty in your life? Is fear rising up? Are rising prices at the grocery store and the gas pump causing you to be stirred to anger and fear? Has a recent loss left you longing for comfort? Life in a fallen world isn't easy, and when these kinds of trials and adversities strike, they can leave us longing even for a moment of peace. And so this morning, I want to Ask, let the words of Scripture talk to that place in your heart that longs for true and lasting peace. Allow the Word of God to minister His Word to you and to give you hope in what is written down for our benefit. How can we have true and lasting peace in a fallen world? I want to give you three thoughts this morning that are tied to recognizing the incarnation of Jesus as our promised King. Number one, true and lasting peace belongs to those who rest in Jesus as their shepherd king. In John 16, Jesus spoke these words to his disciples in verse 33. He said, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome, I have prevailed, I have conquered the world. Micah 5 Verse 5, the prophet Micah says, He will be our peace. Jesus, in John 16, verse 33, says to his disciples, I will be your peace. He rescued us from the corruption of the world by his divine power, and he will keep us in the midst of a corrupted world by that same power. The call to us is to rest and to trust in him, to trust that when he says all things work together for the good of those who are called according to his purposes for those who love God that he not only means it but he has the power to accomplish it that when he says be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication make your requests known to God and the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus that he will give that peace that he will provide for our needs and that he will powerfully protect our hearts as we come to him that when he says seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, speaking of material needs, will be added to you, that he will faithfully provide it. Jesus stands and shepherds his flock with divine strength that has overcome the world. How much time and energy do we waste worrying, fearing, anxious that what he has promised will not come to pass? Let us believers, members of Auburndale Baptist Church, be reminded this morning that all of God's promises to us find their yes and amen in Christ Jesus, whose divine strength and loving faithfulness reassures us that he alone is our true and lasting peace in a fallen world. True and lasting peace belongs to those who rest in Jesus as their shepherd king. Secondly, true and lasting peace belongs to those who repent of sin, not just as a one-time act, but as a lifestyle of continually submitting our lives to the rule and reign of King Jesus. Repentance is not only a product of a life surrendered to Jesus as king, but it is necessary for true and lasting peace because sin 
is a peace destroyer. Think about all that was destroyed in just the first sin in the garden. Think about the relationship between Adam and Eve and and the Lord. The relational peace that existed between Adam and Eve as husband and wife. The peace between creation and mankind. Sin brought friction and disharmony to all of them. Think about Micah's day. Israel and Judah, they, they threw off God's rule, choosing instead to live in rebellion, choices that did not lead to true and lasting peace. And it's no different in our day. As fallen human beings, we sin every day. And that sin has consequences. Our relationship with the Lord, even as Christians who have peace with God, is impacted. The Father disciplines his children when they sin. Why does he do that? Because he wants them to have peace. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 11 says, For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. It's not a very peaceful feeling when we're disciplined by the Father. But later it yields, what? The peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. That is, for those who have repented of sin and walk in righteousness, in repentance, in coming to the Lord and submitting every area of our hearts and lives to Christ, we find the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Repentance is necessary when our sin affects others as well, for it's through repentance that peace and relationships are restored. We see that in Matthew 18 and other passages. If we want to be a people who experience true and lasting peace through Jesus in the midst of a fallen world, then we must be a people willing to confess our sins and turn from them, joyfully submitting our lives to the rule and reign of Jesus, not only as our Savior, but also as our King. So let me ask you pointedly and abruptly this morning, when was the last time you took time to confess your sins to the Lord or to another whom you've sinned against? If we would desire God's peace, then let us strive to be those who keep short sin accounts with the Lord and with one another, quick to acknowledge our sin and to turn from it. Repentance is not only a key ingredient to the way we experience peace in a fallen world, but listen, repentance is evidence of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that we've been given a new heart. It's the fruit of that faith. And so when we repent of our sins... Not only do we have the assurance that he forgives us of our sins and cleanses us from all unrighteousness, but it reminds us that we have peace with God through the blood of Jesus. Third and finally, how can we have true and lasting peace in a fallen world? By resting in Jesus, by repenting of sin, and finally by remembering the hope of our coming king. Remembering the hope of our coming king. We rest in our shepherd king. We repent of our sins, and we remember our coming King. This is not the way it will always be. And so in the face of coming difficulties for God's people, Micah encouraged them by pointing them forward to the coming of the promised King. On this side of the cross, Christ has come, Christ has died, Christ has risen. On this side of the cross, we can have peace in the midst of our temporary sufferings as we remember that same King will soon return. And on that day, the trials and tribulations of this world and all the effects of the curse from Genesis 3 will be no more. And we will finally see what Paul proclaimed in Romans 8, 18, that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. In the midst of our present sufferings that will soon come to an end, let us set our eyes not on the things that yield temporary peace, not on political leaders, financial security, or the other things that we try to find peace in for just a moment. But at this Christmas season, as we sing the Christmas hymns, as we see the nativity scenes, as we walk through an incarnation series, let us be reminded of the true and lasting peace that is available to us through King Jesus, our shepherd king who was born into obscurity, who was born from eternity past in God's perfect plans, has been worked out all through Scripture, who beckons us to himself and says, come to me and turn from your sins and find the peaceful fruit of righteousness. In King Jesus, the one who came to be our true and lasting peace, we find peace 
both for this life and in the midst of the fallen world, and we find peace that is true and lasting forevermore because his reign will never end. He is our king. He lives forevermore, and he sits on David's throne, and the Bible tells us he is coming again. And so as we think about that first coming of Christ, let our eyes be set on the second coming of Christ, our great hope that reminds us that the suffering and the trials and the temptations and the tribulations of this life are but a breath compared to eternity in the presence of our King who we worship. Let's take a moment and pray. And then we will close in song. Father, we thank you for this promise. We thank you that from the lips of the prophet Micah, we have the assurance that our king has indeed come. We don't look for the birth of a Messiah in Bethlehem any longer. He has been born. He has come in fulfillment of all of the promises of Scripture hundreds of years before he ever arrived. And he has lived the perfect life that we could not. He has become our substitute. He has borne our judgment that our sins deserve on the cross. And now he calls us to come and to submit our lives to him. The beginning of his ministry, he said, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And that kingdom exists now because Christ reigns on his heavenly throne. So help us, Father. By the power of your spirit, move in our hearts to set our eyes on King Jesus. To remember the great hope of his coming return that is not so far off. And may it give us hope and peace in the midst of this fallen world that we live in. We pray in the name of our strong, majestic King Jesus. Amen.